Bibles, uh, turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Uh, or 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. We're continuing on with our series, Church on Mission. We're taking a look at the local church and the mission that God has set before us as a church, as individuals, and how we can be ready and carry out this mission that God has given us um, to do. 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. Paul writes this to Timothy. He says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Before the internet, uh, before cell phones, back when cable television wasn't in every home, it wasn't in my home when I was that age, before there were a lot of people that had all these fancy video games when video games were simply this little ball that bounced back and forth on the screen with these two rectangular bars and he moved up and down. Those were pretty high tech. Pong, that's right. Before any of that, we spent as kids a lot of time at a place that seems a little foreign to some kids. That would be outside. If we were inside, our parents would say, you need to go outside because we don't want you inside. But that was okay because we like to be outside. Outside was a great place. And you see, when you were a kid, the neighborhood at that time became kind of your personal kingdom, if you will. This area of a couple of few blocks where you were allowed to ride your bike became your domain. You managed it. You protected it. You took care of it. You knew everything that was going on. If anybody wanted to know what was going on, you asked the kids. Because the kids were running around. They saw everything. They knew what was happening at that time. And it was a lot of fun. We built trees and or forts and trees down the street from my house. There were two great big weeping willow trees and in a vacant lot and it wasn't really maintained, but these two great big trees were there and they had the big weeping willow pieces that hung down and we'd swing on those. We'd climb up in the trees and throw sticks back and forth at each other. I can't believe we didn't poke anybody's eye out, but we didn't. We'd throw them back and forth at each other. We had a great time. We made a lot of games up ourselves. We pretended that they were bad guys around every corner. We ran around with toy guns. That's a bad plan now. Don't recommend that. But we did, and it was a lot of fun, and it was a great deal. And for us kids, for about 5 or $10, a kid of 10 could be equipped for every scenario. You could be equipped and have the ultimate tool it was something that everybody wanted to have, at least everybody that I hung around with wanted to have. Back in the day, we had these. This is what we called at the time survival knife. Now, don't panic because this knife that's in this pouch won't cut hot butter. Even if the butter was left on the counter for the day, it wouldn't cut that either. But this was the ultimate tool you could be equipped. Now, go with me on this for a minute. If you take a look at it, in the end, you had a compass. So you always knew what direction you were going, but it gets better. Wait, there's more. If you spun the top of the handle off, if you spun it off, it was like some hidden magic storage compartment. And this one has everything in it as, as it was. Inside, we find matches, because you, you never know when you might need to signal how a campfire or signal somebody for distress. Inside, there was fishing line and a hook, just in case you needed to catch your dinner there was a little piece of wire that you could unwrap. And around the handle, there were two little rings. And you hooked the rings on the wire, and you could use that to saw sticks, I think. I think if you tried to do that, I could have tried starting at my childhood, and I would still be sawing. But theoretically, that's what it was for. This was the ultimate thing. And it even had, even had on the outside a sharpening stone. So we had a sharpening stone. You could sharpen your knife again. That didn't work well. If you look at this knife, you can tell that didn't happen very well. But you could use that. This was the ultimate tool. Basically, there was nothing in the urban jungle of 11th and Spruce that could stand in my way. Because I had that, right? I was equipped. And I had one. My buddy had one. We were set. 
You couldn't mess with us. We could take care of any situation with that. It's all about having the right tools. Now, that really never changes when you get older. You have to be equipped to do the things that you need to do. And I find this is often a problem at my house. I find this is a problem. There are some things I don't do because I just don't have the equipment for it. Some of the things when you're working on a car and you look at it and there's things that look totally unfamiliar, it doesn't look like things used to look, you just don't have the equipment to take care of it. Sometimes there are things around the house, projects that you want to do, you just don't have the proper tools. You're not equipped for it. You're not equipped between the ears because you don't know how to do it, and you're not equipped with the right tools to accomplish the task. There are a lot of different things that we try and have to have the equipment for. As we are carrying out the mission God has called us to, we need to be equipped. We need to be equipped as we're going out to carry out this mission. In 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, Paul instructs Timothy on how to be equipped to carry out the mission of spreading the gospel. That's what this little section is. It's how to be equipped with this. As followers of Jesus, we have to be equipped by learning God's word in order to accomplish the mission. We have to be equipped by knowing God's word in order to accomplish the mission. There are some things that we learn from this passage. We're going to go back to 2 Timothy 3. We're going to look at verse 16, but we're just going to look at the first part of 16. We're going to break it up into two pieces. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16, the first part. It says, all scripture is God-breathed. We're just looking at that section. All scripture is God-breathed. Paul is reminding Timothy the origin of where Scripture comes from. Scripture, you see, is not the result of our will. It's the result of God's action. God inspired this word. God was active and communicating to his creation with it and through it. Followers of Jesus have been left here to accomplish this mission of telling others about him. Each of us as followers has God's spirit dwelling inside of us, and we also have God's word to guide us. Now, this isn't a foreign concept. This whole idea of having God's word as our guide, God's word to lead us, it's not something new. If you flip back with me to Psalm chapter 119, Psalm 119, if you turn back to there, verses 11 through 16, we see this, this is a common idea. It says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Praise be to you, O Lord. Teach me your decrees. With my lips I recount all the laws that come from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. If you go to 105 of that same psalm, it says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light. For my path. From the time the Israelites were following God, He has used His word to guide us. He's used His word to lead us. This is what He did. This is how it worked to direct us to follow. The Jews in Jesus' day memorized the Torah. And now the Torah was, you know, the first five books of the Old Testament. And by the time a child was the age of 12, they had to memorize the first five books of the Old Testament. Now, think about that for a minute. All the people that start Bible reading plans and quit in Leviticus, they memorized all that, okay? All of those laws, it is daunting. And these kids were doing it. It makes me feel a little silly when I think about it, that uh, it's such a challenge for me. But these kids were doing, this is what was expected. They understood the value of knowing God's word. They had to know the word. It was the very words of God. They got that. They understood that. And so they wanted to know. They needed to know. They valued that. They valued it's where it came from. The question for us is, do we value, take seriously, knowing the word of God? For the follower of Jesus, in order to be equipped for the mission, we have to spend time in God's word. You see, as much as preachers like myself would like to think so, a 20 or 30 minute sermon once a week isn't enough, okay? It's not. We spend time preparing for this, but ultimately this is just one small part of your spiritual walk every week. It has to be much more than this. It's up to us as individuals, everybody in this room, myself included, to take ownership 
in this area of our life. It's up to us to take ownership in knowing God's word. It's up to us to take ownership in our walk with Christ. We have to continue to pour scriptures into ourselves, to study, to seek understanding. Are we continuing to study? Are we students of the word? Do we care about knowing what it says here? I hope we do. I hope this is a valuable thing for us. Do we look at the Bible and do we hold it in reverence? Do we hold what it says as important? Do we remember its source? We remember this is God breed. This is the words of God for us to learn from. It's inspired by the creator of the universe. Do we remember that? Do we think about that often? You see, scripture isn't just a piece of pop psychology theory that has come our way and we just take the scripture, we put it alongside some other ideas that we have and just kind of congeal the whole thing together and come up with some kind of worldview that makes us feel good. It's not the way it works. You see, scripture is God breathed. This is the authority. This is where it comes from. This is where we go to first. We have to take scripture study seriously. We have to do more than just understand the gist of things and call it good. I'm a guy. I know what that's all about, understanding the gist of things. When my wife talks to me, I try and get the gist of it, okay? Sometimes I don't get the gist of it. When I'm looking at instructions, I try and get the gist of it. When somebody says, here's how you get to this certain place, I go, yeah, I got the gist of it. I go here and there, and it's close enough. When it comes to knowing scripture, it's not... We don't function on this whole idea of being close enough. I know enough, good enough to get by. This isn't how this works. We have to continue to be studying God's word. We have to revere it because this is given to us by our creator. It's not something we take, we look at it and go, yep, that's pretty good, and put it on a shelf next to other books like Dr. Phil and say, this is just one of my collection of things that I go to to be encouraged. This is the authority that comes from God. That's the thing we have to understand and we have to remember. We have to revere it. If any of us, if we got a letter from the president, whatever we think about any president we've ever had, if we've ever received a a letter from the president handwritten to us, we think that was pretty important. We'd hang on to it because it was written to him, by him, to us. We might even give it a place of honor, hang it on our wall, I don't know. We would think it was important. People go out of their way to seek autographs from people. They line up in long lines just to get the autograph of somebody famous. They want to hear from somebody famous and be around them, have their signature on a baseball, on a piece of paper, whatever it is. They want people's autographs because we care. they care about them and they admire them. And depending on whose they are, they might fetch a high price if you ever sold them and needed the money. They're important to us because of who they're from. Their words that they write down, their signature is important because of who it is. Each of us has something more important than that. We've been given God's word, and it's important because who gave it to us? God himself. God gave us his word, and we have to learn to honor it, obey it. We have to learn to hide it in our hearts and know it and understand it. Paul goes on to say, "What? how is this tool used, this Tool that's been inspired, breath, the breath of God. The second part in 2 Timothy 3, the second part of verse 16, we'll start at the beginning. It says, All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Let's look at that again. It's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Paul's pointing out to Timothy the usefulness of Scripture. Scripture had value. It had a purpose. It's not just some good ideas. It had a purpose. It was a tool to be used, Uh, particularly as they were dealing with a lot of false teachers. There were a lot of false teachers in that day, and Scripture was the baseline. If people were saying things that weren't true, you could go back and say, no, you line it up against what's here and say, no, this isn't correct. The words of God, the Gospels, this is what who Jesus is. This is what it's about. These are the things we have to understand. We have to understand what's true and what's right. And we do that to this day. Paul Paul points out to Timothy uh, that teaching is uh, is his primary task, and it's useful for that. Timothy can use God's word as a way to teach. 
Paul points out also that people have gotten away from what's right and what's true. If we look back on 1 Timothy 4.6, he talks about this a little bit. He gives Timothy warning in this and what to do. He says, watch your life and your doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. This is something that's important. This is a great issue of concern, keeping track of this, being obedient to the word. 2 Timothy, if we look look to 2.24 and 25, we look to that. 2 Timothy 2.24 and 25 says this. And the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Those who oppose him must be uh, must gently instruct in hoping that God will grant them repentance and leading them to acknowledge the truth. Knowing what the truth is, being able to deal with these situations that comes up, <coughs> it's our tool to carry out the mission. Dealing with these things that arise, it's so important that we know it. Are we using... Scripture as a tool when it comes to God's mission to lead others to him. We live in a world that seeks to conform Scripture to our opinion. We have Scripture, it's here, but we seek to take the Scripture and make it kind of work to our advantage, to our favor, to what our worldview is. We take it, we bend it, we twist it, we shape it, and we hope that it kind of lines up where we're at. But that isn't the way it works. Scripture doesn't exist to support our worldview. Doesn't. Scripture exists for the creator of God to communicate with his creation. That's the purpose of all of this. It's communicating with us. He uses his word to do that. And it continues. If we continue to study it, continue to know it, it continues to do that day after day. I've been around this planet for 43 years. I've been around the Bible my whole life. And every time I pick it up and study, there's always new things that come out. As I understand it more, as I understand scripture more, as I understand the background more, where it's coming from, what the the writer is going through at the time, I understand more and it makes more sense to me every day. I'll never understand it all. I could live to be 100 years old and I'd never understand everything that's here and, and fully come to grasp everything that is written in scripture, but I'm working. I'm trying to learn it more and more. As followers of Jesus, we have to place a high value on knowing and learning God's word. You see, as smart as we think we are, and we think we're pretty clever sometimes, it pales in comparison to our creator. The word exists not for us to keep to ourselves, to make us pious and feel good about ourselves, but it exists to point others to Christ. We use this word as a tool to point others to him, to share the great things of God, what Jesus has done for us, to show how God's kingdom is different from this earthly kingdom, what that looks like, and why we live and why we do the things that we do. It's important. It's fascinating to go to museums or antique stores for me. I love that, to look at some of the tools. And if we look, we can find something that's pretty unique at times. I have some pictures of some things. Adam, you want to put one of those up? Does anybody know what that is? Cream separator. There you go, cream separator. We don't do a lot of cream separating, okay? We had this part growing up in my house, but we put plants in it. <laughs> but we didn't do a lot of cream separating, but it had a purpose and it had a tool. Okay, what's the next one? What's that? Brazen bit. Brazen bit. Yeah, it's a drill. We drill things with that. It's not a DeWalt. You don't put a battery in it. And it, the only way it runs out of juice is if you run out of juice, which I think would happen rather quickly if you got on the end of that and tried to drill through a nice piece of oak. It would be a little challenging. Okay, what's the next one? Ah, does anybody know what that is? It's a little weirder. But <laughs> this device is actually used to pick apples. Use it, reach up, pull them down, pick them. I don't know why you needed a tool for that. You can use your hand, but that's what they used it for at the time. I think there's one more. Ah, this is important. Does anybody know what this is? 
No, I wish it was. This is a surgery kit, a surgeon's kit. Now, as I look at this, I see saws and knives and a hacksaw looking thing and something that looks like you'd put it in a miter saw. And I think, you know what? If I saw that, I would be healed, right? <laughs> if I had an issue with my body and somebody came in, they flipped the case open, I'd say, you know what? Feeling pretty good. Not so bad. But these are tools, and they had a purpose. They had a unique purpose. They had something they were used for. When we look at Scripture, we have to remember that it is a tool, one with a purpose that we use if we seek to live for Jesus and to tell others about it. It has a purpose. It's more than just making us feel good. It's more than just finding an encouraging word. This is our guide. This helps us as we live our lives. It points us how to live, and it points other people to Jesus. This is a tool that we have. We have to remember to use it. There's a third lesson that we learn from this passage, and we're going to go back to verse 17 of 2 Timothy 3. 2 Timothy 3, verse 17. This is how he closes this little section out, this chapter out. It says, So that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. In the final verse of 2 Timothy 3, Paul gives us the purpose or the result of the proper use of Scripture. And that is so that we are equipped for every good work. If we, like Timothy, are going to be ready for the mission, we have to be students of Scripture and to use this tool to advance the mission. Accomplishing God's mission isn't something we can do in our own strength with our own knowledge. It's not going to happen. If left to our own devices, left to our own power, we can't do it on our own. We can't do it on our own, but we have to understand what God desires for our life, what God is calling us to do. We can find this is a tool and an encouragement and it helps us, gives us words to speak to be able to communicate about our creator. We have to be ready. Each of us needs to be ready and prepared as we go out. 1 Peter 1, verse 13. This is what Peter says. 1 Peter 1, 13. It says, therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when the Lord Jesus Christ is revealed. We have to be prepared. Our minds need to be prepared for action. We're prepared for action when we know God's word, when we study his word, when we hide it in our hearts. Do we, as believers, take seriously this whole idea of being prepared? Do we equip ourselves by knowing God's word? Do we equip ourselves by taking an interest in what is here and having a desire to know this word and to memorize it, to learn it, to understand what it means, to understand what it's about? I hope we do. I hope we're spending a lot of time with that each and every day. We must continue to study the word and to grow as we go out. The point is that... We don't have to know this certain amount of information in order to make disciples. That isn't the point. But rather, we need to be disciples if we are going to make disciples. You got that? We got to be disciples if we're going to make disciples. If we're not a disciple, if we're not growing, if we're not learning what it's like to follow Jesus, we can't make disciples. It's as simple as that. We have to continue to be growing ourselves and learning what it means to follow God. We have to study and equip ourselves by knowing his word. We have to be ready for that. We have to be ready to accomplish the task, to have the tools to do this. I have at my house a small collection of tools. Uh, some people have tons of stuff. I have a friend that whose garage looks like a tool shop exploded. It's awesome. I love to go there and just look. I couldn't use it, so it wouldn't do me any good if he gave it to me. But it was neat to look at. But I have some tools in my house to accomplish things. But one thing I've discovered, though, is I tend to get myself in trouble because sometimes I'm ill-equipped for the job at hand. For example, have you ever tried to use a standard size socket on a metric bolt? 
because you didn't have the metrics. So you're like, you're just hoping that it's not too tight so you don't round it off. Hoping you just, just, just a little bit, just kind of inch out a little bit at a time so you don't hurt it. Or maybe you've used your pocket knife as a screwdriver. Okay. I've killed a lot of pocket knives that way. <laughs> Using it as a screwdriver. It gets pretty rough. You snap the tips right off them if you're not careful. So you got to make sure you get a good one. Have you used vice grips instead of the correct size wrench? Instead of going through and finding the right wrench, you say, this ought to work, and you just clamp it on, hold it tight, and hope it doesn't break loose. And again, round the end of the bolt off. It's always a bad plan. You understand what I'm saying? It never goes quite as planned, usually. Bolts get stripped, patience gets tried, and sometimes we just aren't able to get the project done because we don't have the right tools. Are we ready to get this job done? Are we equipping ourselves for the mission by knowing God's word? Are we ready to go? Are we ready to communicate God's word? The world is hard sometimes. It challenges us. It pushes us. It stretches us. But are we ready to go out? Are we ready to go? Do we know God's word? Have we hit it in our hearts? Are we continuing to grow? Are we continuing to learn from it? Are we continuing to seek its truth that comes from it? Are we increasing our knowledge of scripture? Knowing God's word and its truth so that we're not deceived by all the things that the world throws out that tries to trick us with. Are we ready? Are we prepared? I hope we are. As followers of Jesus, we have to be equipped by knowing God's word if we're going to carry out the mission. Scripture is God-breathed. It's God's tool for the mission. And it helps us to lead others to him. We've come to a point in our service where we have the opportunity to make a decision. We have an opportunity to reflect upon where we're at in life and if we want to join that mission. We invite you to come today as we stand and sing and we think about what Christ has done for us. If you would like some prayers, we'd love to pray with you after church. We'd love to encourage you. But we invite you to come as we sing.